G'day everybody, how are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope you are super well. In this episode of Learn Photography, we're going to talk about low light and shooting at night photography. And all the tools that you will need, you can find in your camera, bar a couple of minor accessories. By the end of this video, you will have all the information you need to get great low light exposures. Every time you halve your shutter speed, you halve the amount of light that you are collecting. If you go from a quarter to an eighth of a second, you've got half the light. If you go from a 50th to a 100th, or from a 1,000th to a 2,000th of a second, in each of those steps, you are halving your light. And the same is the case in the opposite direction. If you go from an eighth to a quarter, a quarter to a half, or a half to a second, you are doubling the amount of light that is arriving at your sensor plane or onto your film. The shutter is a very powerful tool for getting us more light to work with. But of course, it doesn't work in all situations. There are some situations like people moving, sports, fast cars, people playing basketball, wildlife, and certain action situations where you have to keep your shutter high. But if we take all of those out of the equation and we're doing something like we're doing right here, night cityscapes, then it might be okay wherever your shutter speed is. And quite frankly, sometimes, if you wanna get a shot like this, but there are people moving around, if you get your shutter speed slow enough, you can almost make them disappear. You can almost turn them into ghosts. Now, a little rule of thumb, a little trick, if you have people walking and you want to still see that they're people but you want them to be anonymous, one eighth of a second nails that for you. If you've got vehicles sort of cruising through a city at sort of medium pace, slow to medium pace, you want them to be at a 15th or a 30th of a second so that they're there, but they're non-distinct. Using your shutter, what it does, if you only use your shutter, it allows you to keep your ISO wherever you want it to be. And I suppose most of us, if we could have our cake and eat it, would keep our ISO at base ISO, and that way you get the highest quality image with today's technology. Shutter can allow all that for you until you get into extremely low light situations, and then we have to employ some other tools. But shutter is a very powerful one. Now, one aspect of shutter, as we get lower and lower, of course, we do get into camera shake situations, and there is a rule of thumb from the, the good old days where your shutter speed should be double your focal length. So if your focal length is say a 50 millimeter lens, you should have a shutter of one 100th. That has all been turned on its head since we have in-body image stabilization as well as VR or optical image stabilization within our lenses. This is an amazing transformation, which I've, I feel so excited to have been part of this unfolding. To begin with, we started to see it in our lenses, and then as we've moved to the mirrorless era, it is in the bodies of our cameras, and now they are getting ridiculous, where we have cameras with five, six, seven, and even eight stops. And that's directly related to f-stops. That literally means in regards to shutter speed, because f-stops and shutter speeds, when you halve them or double them, they do the same thing, they halve or double light. And what that literally means is, say you need to be one one hundredth of a second, go to a 50th, that's one stop, halve that again, you go to a 25th, that's another stop. You can essentially go all the way to eight stops. What I have found with a lot of lenses that I've tested in low light handheld is that, let's say 16 mil, 20 mil, 50 mil, 85 mil, 135 mil, all of these lenses, once you get them to an eighth, a quarter, a half a second, you just start to kind of reach the limits of physics. And really, I've never been able to get any of these lenses beyond half a second or a second handheld. We, we just reach an absolute limit of how much is the camera likely to move in a given space of time. And as humans, we sway, we rotate, things happen. Some manufacturers and users have stated they can go beyond one second handheld. I'm yet to really prove it to myself and I would say a safe rule of thumb with the majority of lenses up to maybe somewhere around a focal length of 105 or 135 
it's a quarter of a second, a half a second, something like that. But IBIS and lens stabilization is a massive tool for helping us work in low light. The next tool we have at our fingertips is Aperture. Now, of course, Aperture, if you don't know, is a little diaphragm within your lens that gets bigger and smaller. And it has two things that it does. It lets in more and less light and it changes depth of field. Now, the more light that you let in, the shorter your depth of field. So another tactic that you can employ is using a lens that's 2.8 f2.8, f2.0, f1.8, 1.4, 1.2, 1, and even as far as 0.95 and beyond, although they are not very common lenses. Now, this technology has continued to improve in the sense that we have had fast, we call them fast lenses, I think it's because we can have fast shutter speeds if we have large apertures. That's what it allows you to do, increase the shutter speed. We have had fast lenses for a long time. They've often been compromised when they are at their largest aperture. These days, with the Z mount, the E mount, the RF mount, the XF mount, and beyond, a lot of these lenses, not all of them, but a lot of these lenses can be used at their widest aperture and you still get the same level of image quality. For example, I've worked with the Nikon Z lenses, the 85 1.2, the 50mm 1.2, these are extraordinary lenses that allow you to shoot wide open and there is still no compromise being wide open. The downside of these lenses are one, they're expensive and two, they're large. The more light that you are bringing in means the glass physically has to expand to match that aperture and more glass means more money and it means more weight. So it's not for everybody the increasing aperture solution certainly a lot of people employ it and of course some of the most expensive lenses we can see ever are wildlife lenses for example 400 millimeter 2.8 lenses so they are very fast they let a lot of light in but they are still very big telephoto lenses if you don't want to change your shutter you don't really want to change your iso you can address low light potentially with your aperture. It might be enough to get you over the line. Now, the next tool that we have at our disposal is ISO. And really that's a difficult one because every sensor, every camera is different. And we started back with CCDs, then we went to CMOS, then we've gone to BSI CMOS, stacked CMOS, and now we have global CMOS sensors. They all have different high ISO performance. And then on top of that, we have Micro Four Thirds APS-C, which comes in Canon size and Nikon and Sony size, so they're different. Then we have 35mm sensors, small, medium format and medium format. They all have different noise performance. And then those formats have different megapixels. And in the main, the less megapixels you have, the better high ISO performance. Although megapixels has gone up as high ISO performance has improved and thus we've kind of kept getting more megapixels and high ISO performance, look, it has improved probably not at the same speed as everything else. And then fully electronic sensors, depending on how fast they end up getting with global being the end of the road, they also have different high ISO performance. And thus, there are so many variables, but if we look back to the days of film, where if you wanted to change from 400 ISO to 3200 ISO, you literally had to remove your film from your camera and put in another roll of film or run two different cameras. When it came to medium format, you had different backs and you could remove the backs and the different backs could have different film types in them and you could remove them halfway through a roll of film. We live in a world of luxury now when it comes to ISO, but of course, base ISO is the true representation of any sensor and from then on what we're basically doing is amplifying the signal that's coming off that sensor. Now anytime you amplify sound or images you start to create noise and when it's sound that's a hiss and when it's images well it's what we call I suppose grain which strangely enough we had grain with film as we got into higher ISOs. And thus, this is a little bit of a holy grail, and you'll have cameras like the A7S III, the A7S II, uh, the Nikon D3, D700. These were really 
fantastic, somewhat lower megapixels. In all cases, they were 12 megapixels, but fantastic high ISO performance. Obviously, the Sonys are better than those older Nikons because those older Nikons were released 2007, 2008, 2009. The Sony a7S3 is a current model. So ISO, obviously that gives you more light, but as I said, that's somewhat of an artificial amplification. And you just have to keep in mind that the higher you go, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400 and beyond, you are slowly increasing your noise. It is pretty much accepted that the smaller the sensor, the worse it gets. So if you have a micro four thirds, 12 megapixel sensor, APS-C 12 megapixel sensor, 35 mil 12 megapixel sensor, small medium format 12 megapixel sensor. If all sensors are made with exactly the same technology, the small medium format, which has the largest photo sites should be best at collecting light. That's how it works. So even if we're on the same ISOs, depending on sensor size, you might get different results. And we're now moving into a time where AI noise reduction is very impressive at removing noise. Last time I played with it, I think I put something like a 3200 or a 6400 ISO image into Photoshop, passed the AI noise reduction over it, and it almost came back to the kind of the base ISO look of what my camera could achieve. And in effective real-term use cases, usage, even so it's not exactly the same as base ISO, for most applications, which is Instagram, the web, presentations, TV, it's gonna look the same. And the only time you might see a difference is if you're printing large, over a meter, three feet, over two meters, six feet. Under that, you're just not gonna see the difference. So we're now moving into an interesting time where ISO might get way more powerful because we can go higher and there is AI noise reduction being applied. And this may start to happen in camera. And with cameras like the ZF and the new XP7 processor, Nikon is stating that there is noise reduction happening within camera. So what that means is it's computational. There's more processing power to think about what to do with that grain. AI is the next step where it's analyzing it in a different way rather than doing it mathematically it's doing it by thinking about what's actually in the picture i won't deep dive any further into that but they are different ways of solving the same problem and definitely ai noise reduction does give you a better outcome because it's thinking about faces it's thinking about details and it is applying the noise reduction not as a blanket but more precisely now, if this sort of noise reduction comes to the internals of our cameras, that's going to be a real game changer because it's possible that 3200, 6400, 12800 might not be that different to base ISO as it comes out of the camera. And how Nikon and I believe Sony are doing it with the A93 as well, there's noise reduction going on there because global sensors are more noisy than all the other types of sensors. So it's kind of built into the raw files. I'm not quite sure how that works and whether we can actually go back to a raw, raw file if we want to. And I certainly would want to still have access to my raw file and be able to process it a different way. But I do think there's a chance that a kind of AI level of noise reduction may come to our cameras of course, we see this in phones now where we've got all sorts of tricks going on for low light, multiple exposures, long exposures, and all sorts of noise reduction. The area of the sensor versus the area of, say, the sensor we're using here, a 35 mil sensor, extremely different. And thus, ISO, powerful tool. It's come a long way. It definitely could go further. Think very carefully about your use case. If you do a lot of low light, then maybe you don't want 45, 50, 60 megapixels, maybe you would be better off in the 12 or 24 megapixel realm. Think about that when you're buying a camera. Do I do a lot of low light? Do I want to spend a lot of money on fast lenses? Is the low light something that I can do with slow shutter speeds? Or is it something that I have to have high shutter speeds? These are all things to think about when it comes to low light and night photography. 
Now, of course, the first tool that we have at our disposal is artificial light, and that might come in the form of flash light or continuous light. Now, both of them are valid, and we're getting more and more high-powered continuous lights that run off batteries every day, like my brand new Hobolite Iris. Great little light, you can have it in your pocket, and for night situations, it's gonna fill in in front of the camera for quite a number of meters. Traditionally though, if we were shooting at an event, a wedding, a corporate event, even sporting events, you will find that flash photography is and can be installed in order to assist the photographer in low light situations. Now, more and more as time passes by and our cameras and our lenses become more powerful in low light, high ISO, which we will talk about, and fast lenses. They have been around a long time, but they're getting better and better. You can now shoot large aperture lenses wide open with modern lenses without a penalty in image quality. I suspect the addition of artificial lighting is slowly diminishing, but it's still absolutely necessary in certain quarters. In order to help yourself out at an event or some sort of night shoot, might be some sort of creative endeavor or a sporting event, you can definitely bring flash or continuous light to help assist with low light, and that's a good one. Now, one thing that's really fun to do at events, which I do often, is I'll crank up my ISO a little bit and try and get my flashlight to be not too different to the ambient light. And what that does is it means that your backgrounds are not just black, they've actually got some texture, detail, color, and movement. That's something worth looking at, trying to balance your flash to your background. You get a mixture of both, it also means you can lower the power of your flash, which makes it last longer. If you're shooting at half power, as opposed to say 1 64th power, you are gonna get so many more fires out of the flash, out of the battery in the flash for that evening. So it's a great way to balance things out and you will get actually way more interesting images. The thing about introducing artificial light is that it changes. It changes where you are, it changes the ambiance. And often as photographers, we're trying to represent what we see. We're not wanting to change it by adding light. So that's just something that we have to think about. Do you want to change what you're photographing by adding artificial light? The final tool at our disposal, which is a little bit like a light, is of course a tripod or monopod. I'm shooting on a monopod tonight because there's absolutely no wind. It allows me to travel lighter and set up quicker. I only have one leg to think about. And well, that's a third of the time to get things moving. If long exposures and super long exposures, one second, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, is not a problem for what you're shooting, and that might be cityscapes like I have here behind me, or it could be starscapes, doesn't matter. Then obviously super long exposures, which yes, this is connected to our first one, the shutter, but you can't go to super long exposures. Ibis will only take you so far, and then you need to move over to a tripod. So a tripod is another essential accessory. And when I first started shooting these sorts of images, I had to have a tripod for absolutely everything. We just did not have in-body image stabilization and we did not have the sort of lenses that we have today that allow you to shoot them wide open and they still look fantastic. And of course, sometimes you wanna shoot at F8 because you wanna get everything in focus. A tripod, a monopod, something to rest your camera on can also be a great accessory. All right, well, I hope this has helped with your low light or night photography. I'd love to know any of your ideas of how do you get more light into your camera? Is it ISO, is it shutter, is it aperture, is it IBIS, is it a tripod? All right, everybody, well, thank you so much for being here tonight and joining me for low light slash night photography. If you have any further thoughts on how we can collect, create more light, let's talk about it in the comments below and I can make an update to this video. I would love to hear all of your thoughts and experiences. All right, well, it's been so good to see you. And if this is your first time here, I'd love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. All right, bye for now.